pure and beautiful and faint all the time. They, they would have been goners. Very few of my patrons actually read Ivanhoe. No one but Robinson Crusoe could have so well prepared me for this situation. Welcome to another vlog style video project. Uh, this is gonna be part one of two. This two-parter is going to pertain to classics. So part one is going to be rereading um, some classics that I have said and, and regard as favorite classics, but a lot of them I have not read for a very, very long time. So I want to reread them to see if they still are my favorite classics. A couple of them I've read a little bit more recently, so I have greater confidence. Uh, the others have some of them are, it's been a really, really long time since I read it. So here's hoping I still love them. Here's hoping that all of them are still my faves. Uh, but the ones I'm going to be rereading for part one are Ivanhoe by Sir Walter Scott, The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux, Peter Pan by J.M. Barry, and Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. I did read Frankenstein last year, so mainly this is on the list just because I want to reread it. <laughs> I figure if I'm doing a classic reread, why not Frankenstein? So yeah, those are classics that I currently still say those are some of my favorites. We'll see if it's still true. Here's, ho here's hoping that they still are. Similar to the music that inspired books vlog, uh, I'm just going to be reading these and then checking in with you as I finish them. So, see you for the first book. Just finished Phantom of the Opera or Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> this is actually the copy that I read like three or four times uh, when I was in high, middle school, high school. I think I read it the first time when I was in middle school, but it all blurs together now. Definitely reread it in high school. Uh, any whoosies, yeah, uh, Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> um, I didn't like it as much as I did back then. Like if I read it for the first time now, I wouldn't then proceed to reread it like three times. But I do still think it's quite good. And I think that people, I guess a bad rap and it's still hilarious to me that Andrew Lloyd Webber hated Phantom of the Opera and then wrote a musical of it. <laughs> like what? But the thing that it most reminded me of having recently read the first uh, three books in the Dandelion Dynasty by Ken Liu. It's kind of what it reminded me of because it goes into a lot of like detail as to like the technical aspects of the Phantom's um, contraptions. Like the musical pays lip service to the fact that he's a genius. Uh, and not just like a musical genius, but that like all the tricks he pulls to, to make everyone believe that he's an opera ghost. It actually explains a lot of the mechanisms of how he's doing that and his past um, where he learned to do that and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And the story, it doesn't, it is like a dramatic gothic romance, I suppose, but it's written as if it's like a story that's pieced together by a third party, Gaston Leroux, who like found, you know, letters and, and, and spoke to witnesses. And it's told from a very like impersonal, impartial perspective, you know, more like a historical record, an article, uh, something like that. So it's, as melodramatic as it kind of sometimes is, it really isn't that melodramatic for an older book. Apologies, my camera ran out of battery. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the, oh, I was talking about melodrama, yes. Technical stuff reminds me of Dental and Dynasty, and then the melodrama is is uh, lessened by the third party assembling the information. But yeah, at the, the part of it that I think I liked a lot more when I was younger was Raoul and Christine and Christine in particular. I'm finding when rereading classics um, because the first one that I finished is Phantom of the Opera, but I have started, um, I've actually gotten most of the way through Count of Monte Cristo already. So I'm feeling this a very similar way. Actually, they're both French books that were translated to English. So maybe it's the French. Both in Count of Monte Cristo, which I'll talk about when I finish it, and Phantom of the Opera, the characterization of female characters like Christine or the many female characters that are in Count of Monte Cristo, because that's a little massive, like, long book. They're very passive and, like, pure and beautiful and faint all the time. And, like, uh, the virtuous dudes that you root for, you know, they love them because they're these, like, delicate creatures that, um, you know, when immoral things occur around them, they, they faint at the very idea of it and whatever. And... It, yeah, this it's, it's more so in Count of Monte Cristo, but in, in Phantom too. And I remember thinking that it was like romantic and sweet and the way that Raoul hangs on Christine's every gesture and movement and the fact that she's like, I can't and I shall have to die. And he's like, no, I cannot live because without you, then I'll die too. And I mean, now I'm like, 
Okay, children, calm down. Because they are quite young too. Christine and Raul are like, I think teenagers. Uh, they say their ages. I think Raul is like 19 and Christine is, uh, I think they said that he's maybe a couple years older than her. So it's like, come on kids, <laughs> come on. I do still find the Phantom, Eric, he has a name in the book, which he doesn't in the musical, to be an interesting character. And I, I don't, uh, the book doesn't really romanticize the Phantom the way that the musical does. Um, people who love the musical, they love the Phantom and they romanticize the Phantom. And you kind of leave the, like, like no one's rooting for Raoul. <laughs> like, I mean, like, realistically, like, you don't want her to end up with the Phantom because, you know, he's a murderer. <laughs> and, you know, that's... There's a lot of consent issues with that whole relationship, but you know, he's been the romanticized character and it's his, it's for him that your heart is breaking. Um, in the book, I feel like it's it's more even. Like you are rooting for Raoul and Christine um, and the Phantom is really, because you don't have like a sweeping musical score, because music can trick you a lot, I find. Like, I, while well, books make me cry, films and TV and, and, and ads on TV are very much more likely to make me cry because the right piece of music with the right visual, even if, like, if you wrote about the same thing, I would be emotionless. But hearing the music and seeing the thing makes me cry. So, like, the Phantom singing at Christine and blah, 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 blah. And plus, they make him a lot better looking than he is in the, in the book. It, like, it makes you... And it doesn't really go to, it, it, it alludes to all of the heinous things he's done. And like, you know for a fact he's a murderer. Um, and like, Christine meant like, sings about him being a murderer. Um, but they're kind of like, but, but you know, but no big deal. He is heartbroken and he's singing for the love of Christine. So like, the book doesn't, it can't do that. It can't like trick you with music. And it does more to explain the horrors of what the Phantom has done and is doing and actually like shows um, the perspectives of people who have known him from before or currently know him uh, more than just like this phantomish figure, like actually know him. And are like, yeah, he doesn't care about people. He doesn't find like, he doesn't really have a moral compass. He has no problem killing people, like does not give a fuck. <laughs> so the book doesn't really like romanticize him plus like this cover is real pretty but this cover my beat up old copy and the pages are all yellowed i read this so many times it's falling apart anyway this is what the phantom looks like not like michael crawford or gerard butler where there's like a little bit discoloration on the little one quarter of the face and she's like oh the horror of seeing you without your mask ah no he's got like they call it a death's head like he's deeply unfortunate looking that his skin is i mean the again the musical does it where uh where they're it, it's supposed to be like the rumors about him and they're like like yellow parchment is his skin a great black hole serves as the nose that never grew and like the they say that as like a you know these are the rumors about the opera ghost but in the book that's legitimately what he looks like so the fact that Christine can feel empathy for him at all considering how much worse he is and how much worse looking he is. Not that looks or everything, but I mean that's pretty horrifying um, to be a death's head like that. Yeah, like I think the book does a good job of writing him in a way where you don't feel zero empathy for him. You do feel a little bit of that like he is the monster that we made him that if he is othered by all of humanity, like why should he feel um, any compunctions about hurting people when he is not a, a member of the human race insofar as the way he feels and has been treated. It's a little like uh, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, where the monster, Victor's creation, is a monster, is willing to kill, is, which is concerning, but he has been othered by humanity. He has been shown only cruelty. He is the monster that you made him. So I think the book, instead of just swooping musical arias and like, oh, so sad that if only he had a prettier face, it could have been together, like, does a better job of being like, no, he's he's done some horrific things. Probably a sociopath. But also, people haven't, like, the world has not been kind to him, so it's not completely one-sided. He's not just a ghoulish monster, but he's not like a romantic hero either. 
So I think it's more fair. I just wish Christine had a little more chutzpah than she does in the book, but it's the era. It's the era and she's not like more like weak and, and woeful than other books of the era. And in the musical, she really doesn't have any um, agency or any, she doesn't really like do anything either. Um, she's pretty much the same. She's, I guess, slightly more scared of him in the book uh, and slightly more willing to go along with whatever he says in the book, a little bit. In the book, it's more like martyrdom. And in the, in the musical, it's more that she's just kind of like freaked out. <laughs> Um, I don't know which is better or worse, but point being, the musical didn't like make her a badass either, so it's not really a complaint that differs between the two. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't love it as much as I, I think, I think my appreciation for it now is more academic, if that makes sense. Not to make myself sound like, you know, oh, I'm so academic. I just mean like, I find like the, the way it's handling Eric the Phantom interesting. The choices that it makes knowing more about the time period and, and I've, pay, I've paid attention more to the Persian which is completely cut from the musical and he's a big POV for what's happened and, and who Eric was before the, the opera, the opera house. Like I, I have an appreciation for it that is more divorced from my emotions where I just find it interesting and I find it compelling and I find it engaging and, and I would reread it. Whereas when I reread it multiple times in middle school and high school, I was like swept up in the, the like mystery and the romance and the Raoul willing to sacrifice himself for, for Christine and Christine sacrificing herself for everybody and the phantom dying over the fact that he won't be loved. And I was just like, you know, more into all of that. And now I'm like, that's fine <laughs> about that part. Um, and there really isn't that much of it. In the book. That's just the part of it that probably appealed to me most when I was a lot younger. Now I'm glad there's not that much of it. That's why I still like it. So it, it means I met that sweet body. Sweet body was enough for me for when I was wanting it, but it's not so much that now when I don't want it that it's that it's too much. So so, so I still like it. I don't know if I would be like this is my favorite classics of all time, but I mean a favorite. Yeah, I still like it. I still like it. And I still would reread it again. This classic still slaps. Well, I did it. I finished The Count of Monte Cristo. It took a minute. I, uh, yeah, this is, this is super, super long. Okay, so first point of assessment, it is too long. People complain about the length. It is too long. I mean, also, it's too heavy because it's so long, so I'm gonna put it down. Um, it's, I feel like this kind of like sprawling, ongoing, tangent-filled storytelling is kind of like, it, th reading this book feels like watching five seasons of a TV show that didn't know that it would get five seasons, you know? <laughs> so it just kept like spinning it out and out and out and like withholding resolution for the like ultimate conflict. So like, oh, we were greenlit for another season. Let's drag it out a little more um, and let's have some random like mid-season episodes that take us off on you know side quests and tangents and character backstories and things like that. That said, that's pretty much as as far as my understanding is. I could be wrong about this but I'm pretty sure. Hi Kathy Jen. Can we not do that right now? Can you stop it? Uh, I believe that it was published serially. Hey! Cat! I believe it was published serially. Um, so and I also believe, which again, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Alexander Dumas was paid by the word. So he definitely had a, uh, um, ow, fuck, ow, why? He definitely had good reason to want to stretch it out. If it was written today, um, well, if it was written today, a lot of things about it would be different. But if it was written today, the length part would certainly be different. It would be either published as a series and therefore have more built-in kind of conclusive arcs for each book to end on or it would be just condensed and a lot of it chopped out yeah because a lot of it it is it is not necessary a lot of it um yeah i still enjoy it even the parts that are not necessary i i find them enjoyable to read through but they're like part of me is also like but all of this this doesn't need to be here so like I'm not so mad about it. Uh, there's other books that have a bunch of unnecessary like guff in them where I'm like, why are you wasting my time with this? I hate everything about this. Whereas with Count of Monte Cristo, I'm like, this is enjoyable. Like the writing is enjoyable and the scene is enjoyable. But the part of me that wants to make progress in the story is like, but 
why am I being told this? Why am I being shown this? It's uh, it's weirdly both the most like insane. Uh, uh, it is both like taken like show don't tell to its furthest extreme, while also doing an insane amount of telling <laughs> instead of showing. Because I, I guess some of the extraneous parts, some of the tangential parts of the stuff that could be cut is actually just a lot of telling as well. It's not always showing you a scene that you don't need to be shown. Some of it is like lengthy ex exposition um, and that kind of thing. Which I guess I'm grateful for because if all of those portions of lengthy exposition had been also converted to scenes to showing us all of that stuff, I mean this book would be twice as long as it already is. Um, so. It's, it's a lot of showing and a lot of telling. As I mentioned when I was talking about Phantom, because I'd already started reading Count, um, the, the female characters are very like passive, uh, wilting, and uh, kind of angelic martyr figures, and or at least the ones that you root for or are supposed to like are that way. Um, they're not allowed to be interesting or to have complicated feelings, um, which, you know, is of its time. It's not It's not the worst example of that that I've seen in older books, but I recall specifically, uh, kind of like I was talking about with, with Phantom, where like I was kind of swept away by the Christine Rowell story. I remember being very much enamored with Valentine and Maximilian's story in Count of Monte Cristo. And reading it now, <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not bad, but yeah, Valentine is like an angelic china doll and not a person. <laughs> or at least the way that Maximilian feels about her is that she's like an angelic china doll. Which I don't love that. It's not horrible. Like it's it's not, it doesn't make me angry reading it. I'm just kind of like, why, why, why did I love this so much? Probably because I was nothing like that ever. So I kind of idealized or romanticized that type of female in love stories. Um, much in the way that these authors did. Because um, I remember at this time in my life, I definitely also preferred Jane and Bingley to Lizzie and Darcy. And Jane in, uh, in uh, Pride and Prejudice is a lot more akin to Christine Daae or Valentine Villefort. They're these sweet, angelic, like the men in their lives are like, but a touch from your hand, but the scent of your glove. You are, you know, you make it heaven on earth by just being there. And then they like faint at the idea of something awful. Um, yeah, I very much was into that. Um, I, I don't know if I would say aspired to it, but more lamented that I was nothing like that. And I was like, yeah, I'm not worthy of a great love story because to be worthy of a great love story, you have to be this like, fainting angelic martyr and you better hope there's a dude around to catch you like he always is in these books because otherwise you know like none of these girls are getting out of their own situations on their own steam like if it hadn't been for the heroic love interest in all of these well uh, jane doesn't really have that but she is quite passive as well uh we're not here to talk about pride and prejudice though but like christine and and valentine they would have they, they <laughs> their lives would have been um, ruined. Like they, they would have been goners if it wasn't for the heroic uh, love interests in their lives. So, you know, not really a practical thing to aspire to, to be so angelic that you might attract the attention of a hero who's willing to risk life and limb to save you. Like uh, in this one, she saves herself. <laughs> there is also, I, I don't know, I don't think it's intended to be read as a criticism of the main character. There are other things that are intended, I think, as criticisms of the main character, like in the text that it is meant to be like that you're think that you're meant to think that's a flaw or that he's gone too far or that he's done something he shouldn't have. But specifically with Valentine, um, slight spoilers, I won't say specifics, but slight spoilers for Count of Monte Cristo. Um, Valentine's value, uh, not just about, yeah, her, basically, she's considered worthy um, by the Count of Monte Cristo and by the extension, the reader, because Maximilian loves her. That is what, like, confers upon her worthiness, which, you know, like, she's written as an angelic and sweet character who 
is entirely worthy unto herself absent his love. So she, for her own merits, considering what an angelic martyr-like character she is, like she shouldn't require Maximilian's love to be considered worthy. Like, my God, if she's not worthy, then who is? So I guess you can interpret it as her worth is like noticed because of Maximilian and wouldn't have been noticed otherwise, but like, I don't like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the book does kind of paint Edmond Dantes and the Count of Monte Cristo as a person who is flawed and has taken things too far and does you know, his uh, his actions have consequences that he does not intend or he realizes in retrospect might have been too much or too far or etc. So he's not painted as like a perfect character or as a character who's like always in the right. But as concerns a lot of the women in the story. Mercedes also is kind of more of a martyr-like angelic figure. Um, and it's, it's really the, she would have good reason to not be that way anymore and it's she's uh, redeemed in the narrative because she is still that way and you're like well <laughs> she shouldn't be and shouldn't have to be yeah <laughs> i've said before in another video i think the video was like the movie was better uh just a bunch of books where i thought the movie was better even if i liked the book and count of monte cristo was in that list and now that i've reread the count of monte cristo yeah um there are some things in the book that i that the movie would be very, very long if it had included a lot of stuff. So it does kind of condense a lot of stuff and combine some things and completely cut out some stuff um, for the sake of time. But if it was like, let's say nowadays, you know, you have just as high quality production value in a miniseries on TV. So if like the Count of Monte Cristo movie had been, you know, that cast and that director and everything, but it had been a miniseries on TV, say three episodes, four episodes, something like that, where you would have time to include everything that you want to include while still, you know, cutting out and condensing stuff because I even said the book too long, too many things, you actually don't need all of that. But so the thing, there's a couple things that I do still think that the the movie where it, it did kind of drastically change the story in certain respects. And I like a lot of those changes. Like I really, really do. I really like also, there's, there's a huge plot line that is entirely absent in the film and I'm frankly glad that it's absent. Like that's not one of the things that I think that you should have a mini series to make time for. And again, I don't want to tell you any spoilers, but the character of Aidi and everything to do with her. Yeah, I don't love that. It's not, again, it's not awful. It's not something where I'm like, yikes, this is terrible. But like, I mean, if it was written nowadays, I'd be like, yikes, this is terrible. For its time, I'm like, for what it is, it's handled okay-ish. But yeah, there's just, yeah. I absolutely understand why the film chose to entirely cut that out. But then by cutting that out, you did have to, there's other stuff they changed that they wouldn't need to change in order to cut out IED. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that you would have to change if you're cutting her out. So like some of the changes I'm like, well, if we're starting with cutting her plot line out, you have to like change everything around that to have new reasons for things to happen, etc. But then a step further, they also change a lot of stuff that I still also really like. So yeah, in particular, again, I'll be vague, um, but everything pretty much to do with Fernand, um, I like what they did in the film. And I think it makes it a stronger narrative. I think it makes it a more compelling and um, a more, I don't know, a, just like a visceral, feeling of injustice that you want to see righted while still by the end of the film being like but the Count of Monte Cristo has gone too far has done things to to like there are still like you know unforeseen consequences um that he hasn't been able to plan for every possible thing so it still does the thing of like showing that like you know the count like showing the flaws in the count's plan while still making it more of a like a like enraging injustice um, that is done. I think it makes it more personal and more visceral in the film, the way that they change who is, who has done what to Edmund and why. So I think that change is really, really good. And part of that change is to like, I don't know that that's exactly why they did it, but some of that is probably at least started because they decided to take out IED. Um, because 
anyway. Anyway, it's a very, very long book with a lot, a lot of like plot lines and a lot of information and a lot of stuff. And like, it's really fun, I think, to read because it's fun watching because it's it's interestingly, I mean, nowadays too, I feel like it would be told from the perspective of the Count, but this is a sort of impartial, omniscient narrator that just like knows stuff. So a lot of stuff, like a lot of the Count's plans, you're just experiencing them as the people who are being affected by them. And you aren't necessarily even told when and where the Count is doing something, but you can like, there are hints and you can piece it together because you know that this book is about him being up to something. So you're like, presumably I'm being shown this scene because this is related to something the Count wants to do or the Count is here even though he's not named. So it is kind of fun in the way that, you know, like films like, uh, like the Sherlock Holmes film, uh, the Guy Ritchie one with Robert Downey Jr. There are scenes that you see play out and then you see that scene like rewound and played back this time knowing that Sherlock Holmes was in disguise and he was actually one of the characters in the scene and you didn't know it. So you know there's nothing quite as gimmicky as that in Count of Monte Cristo but it's the same kind of thing where like you're shown scenes and you're like I think that's the Count of Monte Cristo in disguise. It doesn't say that, it's not told from his perspective and it doesn't really, I mean it basically confirms it later but yeah, it's kind of fun to read it as this kind of like unfolding mystery because like, you know, he wants revenge. You know, he's got money. But what exactly he's going to do? How all these like this like 4D chess that he's playing where like he's having like, you know who it is he wants revenge against. And then there's these scenes where he's like talking to all these other people or disguising himself to talk to all these other people. And you're like, who in the what is this have to do with anything? Why are you disguising yourself to talk to this other random third party person? Who is this? What does this have to do with revenge? And then, you know, one million pages later, the, the, everything converges and you're like, oh, wow, that was a long game. Jeez. <laughs> like, maximum effort. Like, you know, you, you really committed. So it is fun to read it for that reason, because it's not obvious what he's doing at all. It's, it's obvious that he's doing something, but why he's doing it, which, which, how many steps removed are we from the goal of revenge, you know? Um, so yeah, it's fun to watch it unfold. And I'd forgotten a lot of details of that because a lot of that is not in the movie. The movie condenses what he does for the revenges a lot. It's, you know, two-step revenge instead of a hundred-step revenge. So it's a, it's a worthy read. It's very long and it's dated, especially in the women characters, but it's still a good read. Um, but I will definitely be watching the movie more. <laughs> I've already seen the movie a bunch of times and I will definitely rewatch it many more times. Um, the book I'll probably reread again sometime in my life, but yeah. I would still say this is a favorite classic, but I definitely am less in love with Valentine and, and Maximilian. They're fine. <laughs> so yeah, on to the next one. Just finished Peter Pan for the third time in my life. Uh, this time I did it with, uh, the audiobook that's done by, uh, or that's read by Tim Curry, which I didn't really know existed um, until I went to go see what was available and I was like, Tim Curry, that's, that must happen. And I can confirm that that is a delightful way to experience Peter Pan. So if you have not read it or you're looking to reread it, um, I would recommend the audiobook done by Tim Curry. Uh, Any he's Peter Pan, yes, it's so good. It's so good. It will always be a favorite. This will never change. I never say never, I guess, but I really don't see that changing. <laughs> Peter Pan, oh, it's just, it's a classic for a reason. It stands the test of time for a reason. It gets retold over and over again for a reason. It's just so good. And um, I was talking to my fellow Peter Pan lover uh, and also fellow First Law fan, Hillary from Bookborn. And I, I, she did not confirm that she agreed with me about this, um, but I feel like if Joe Abercrombie and Neil Gaiman collaborated to write a middle grade adventure, it would be Peter Pan, or it would be very close to Peter Pan. Um, I, so like, of course this is a favorite of mine because Gaiman and Abercrombie are my two favorites. Um, but there is, I've, I've often, I previously made the connection to Gaiman saying that like, one of the things about Gaiman's writing, especially his middle grade, but all of his writing, is that he just kind of like gets it when it comes to like what it means to be a child, what it felt like to be a child, what the difference is between a child and an adult. Like Ocean at the End of the Lane is one of my favorite books of all time and one of my favorite Gaiman books because the way that he captures 
what it is to be a child and the mindset of a child and and childhood and what it's like living through that he just like hits the nail on the head in this way that like you you didn't you wouldn't have been able to identify it and then he put it into words for you and you were like that's it i don't know how you remembered what it's like to be a kid because i didn't remember until you just said it and now you've like unlocked that memory for me like yes that's what it was like being a kid um, so J.M. Barry, in a much more sort of like fantastical fairy tale way, does that in Peter Pan, um, where he just he hits the nail on the head as to like what it what is the sort of like this sort of quintessence of youth like what is that um, because Peter Pan himself uh, remains a vague and unidentified um, force. <laughs> Uh, in this book, and there's never like an explanation for what Peter Pan is or where he came from or how how Peter Pan is. He gets asked, "Who and what art thou?" by Captain Hook, and the answer that Peter Pan unhelpfully gives is, "I am youth. I am joy." And you're like, um, "Cool." Uh, it's 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 about as useful as his address for Neverland, second to the right and straight on till morning. <laughs> but the way that 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 Peter Pan and the Neverland um, are described and the way that Peter Pan is, he is not innocent in a, um, in a pure positive angelic sense. He is innocent in a selfish and hedonistic sense, which is a lot more what kids are like. Like the stories that paint children as, as sweet and innocent angels, um, that's wishful thinking. <laughs> we would like to think of them that way, but kids think of themselves first and foremost. And uh, in the book throughout, or the story throughout, will we'll throw out things about like, and maybe that's what made Peter the way he is, or maybe that's why Peter is the way he is, or maybe that's the secret to Peter Pan. Um, one of which is that the moment that a child first experiences unfairness is the moment that they are, that they really kind of cease to be a child. That they'll, 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 they might trust you again, but they'll never be the kid that they were before that moment. And there's a moment where Peter has this happen where something is unfair or he perceives it to be unfair and they're like normally this would be that moment for a kid but this has happened to Peter Pan many times and he always forgets about it so he's able to remain this like this spirit of youth because all these things that would would normally enter a child's life and and alter them and push them further down the path of growing up he rejects them he forgets them he does not acknowledge them and some of that is positive and some of it's negative. Like forgetting that you're that you realize that the world could be unfair um, is more of a sort of like a pristine and angelic innocence. But his what also preserves his innocence is the inability and, and lack of desire to care about anything or anyone other than himself. Everything has to be the way he wants it. Things happen because that's how he likes it. Uh, it's his way or the highway. And while we think of being a child or being forever a child or this sort of thing as as a, I guess especially adults, there's a sort of a nostalgia and a, um, a melancholy about, oh, to be a child forever, oh. But there's also many times when we're reminded in the book about the joys that Peter will never experience, can never experience, because he refuses to grow up. And those are joys that can only be known by an adult, like um, the love that he could share with Wendy in a way that is beyond make believe that is beyond them being kids together, beyond him calling her mother. He will never know that kind of a relationship, that kind of joy, or the joy of having your own children, things like that. Because he says, you know, you're not gonna take me and make me a man. And this, this obstinate refusal to grow up is a rejection of also that maturing of that caring about others more than yourself, um, about taking responsibility for things, and so on and so forth. Anyway, basically, Peter Pan is brilliant, and that's why it's one of my favorites, and that's why it will always be a relevant classic, because to be a child, this is it. It's not, like, yes, childhoods change, you know, from generation to generation, you know, one generation grows up on cartoons, the next on video games, the one after that on VR, and like, so on and so forth. But what Peter Pan is about is about the relationship to life, the relationship to those around you, and what as a child what that looks like and what it would have to reject in order to stay that way forever. So this is why it will always be relevant. And then I did, it is kind of Abercrombie-esque because there's a lot of like 
snark and like political social commentary. Um, and Peter himself is a wicked kind of boy. Uh, he's not, like, I already said he's not very angelic, but there, there's truly some wickedness about him. Uh, he can be quite malicious and, um, <laughs> and, and the boys and, well, and Wendy as well, um, I think most films kind of shy away from this, but in, in Peter Pan, they actually kill the pirates. Like, they're not just, like, defeating them, we won the day. They kill them, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, it's pretty dark. <laughs> Bunch of kids killing pirates. So, like, just the very idea of a Neverland, um, like, I feel like that's, what would be more Abercrombie than that? Like, he, he already showed us his version of Lord of the Rings in, in the first Law Trilogy, saying, you know, this uh, hero's quest and chosen ones and uh, this sort of thing, like with your Gandalf type and your fellowship kind of situation. Let me show you the effed up upside down version of that. And that's what the first law trilogy is. I feel like if you, you, if you didn't know about Peter Pan, but you just sort of like suggested the idea of like a middle grade adventure about the spirit of youth, um, you would imagine something quite saccharine. And Peter Pan is like, if Joe Abercrombie was like, I'll do you a fairy tale about the spirit of youth and the malevolent little flying cackling monster that is Peter going around killing pirates with his band of cohorts. That, that feels like something Abercrombie would do. Um, so anyway, yes, love Peter Pan, will forever love Peter Pan. If you've never read Peter Pan, you should read Peter Pan because it's quite mature in its themes. Um, I remember liking Peter Pan as a kid and it being like, I want to go to the Neverland, and I want Peter Pan to take me away there, and I, you know, that sounds fun. And as an adult, it's themes about growing up, and, and what it means to grow up, and about how the parents feel about all this, and all the little, like, social commentary from the narrator of the story, which is also, that's where it's kind of Abercrombie-esque. Um, like, the nods, too, to Hook um, having possibly gone to, like, Eaton, um, and... There's nods to him possibly being related to pirates from Treasure Island. There's like topical social commentary in it that definitely would not, like, kids would not clock that. <laughs> so, anyway, yes. So, 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 so good! Oh, definitely, definitely a favorite. Moving on to the next one, hopefully that will go just as well. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. To be perfectly honest, I was a little nervous to pick this up because I read it quite some time ago and in the interim, I had seen a couple, a couple of adaptations of it, and those adaptations did not wow me or thrill me. Um, not because I was like, this is a bad adaptation, because I was like, the story is not that compelling, is it? Why did I love the book so much? So picking this up now, I was like, is this gonna be one of those where I'm like, yeah, that's not as good as I remember. But it was, I loved it. I still love the Moonstones, so yay for that. And it's a, this is the same problem that um, I've previously expressed is, um, an issue for a lot of Jane Austen adaptations where the charm of the book is often in the narrator and in the narrator being quippy and being witty and in how the narrator is telling you the story. And when you adapt it, that's what you lose. You lose the narrator, now it's just the people doing the things that they're doing. And that's the case with the Moonstone. The story is like decently compelling and it's a pretty good mystery. The answer to the mystery, the like, the final, you know, like wrap up of the mystery is a little not great. <laughs> It's not terrible, but it's kind of a little bit like, it does beggar belief a little bit, but it's still, it's a good mystery. And it is like the adaptations of it weren't again awful, but I was like, you know, it's, why did I love this so much? Basically, I was like, this is a, a pretty good story, but like, why was I like, I love this when I read it. And it, it's the narrator uh, and multiple narrators. So this is told from multiple narrators um, that all are consciously narrating to you. So that's a ton of fun because they kind of break the fourth wall and they kind of talk about what they're choosing to tell you and not tell you, or should they tell you, or shouldn't they tell you, or what will you think of them if they tell you X, Y, Z. So that's a lot of fun. And they also, Wilkie Collins does a really good job making them feel distinctly like different people. So when each of them picks up their part of the story and is like, okay, I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, it feels like a different person is telling you the story now. So it's just very well done on the part of Wilkie Collins to be able to write, uh, to change the voice so well, to believably feel like different characters. And like one of my favorite voices that tells the story and is like probably the majority voice, at least a very, very large chunk of it, and is your intro to the story, is um, the butler from the house that this is taking place in. And I remembered this about it because it's, it's something that they do usually mention in the adaptations because it's such a huge part of his deal. 
but there's just like no real easy way to incorporate it into an adaptation because it's mostly something that he just thinks about and tells you about when he's narrating the story to you so it doesn't make sense to stick it into an adaptation so it's just like largely missing um but he's obsessed and I say obsessed capital O with Robinson Crusoe which is very strange <laughs> and is very funny because at every opportunity when life presents him with a conundrum, he's like, Robinson Crusoe, let me find a random page. And like people will do with a Bible where they're like, random Bible quote, tell me something wise. He does that with Robinson Crusoe. He really judges anybody that has not heard the good word of Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> um, he like talks about how many copies of Robinson Crusoe he's gone through because he just like wears them to tatters. And he does have some pretty good quotes from Robinson Crusoe where he's like, and you know, if that's not portentous or wise, or if this didn't, you know, prepare me for, like, no one but Robinson Crusoe could have so well prepared me for this situation. So yeah, I just, I think this is a really enjoyable read. I'm gonna need to cut this clip short because they're doing repairs on my upstairs neighbor's apartment. There's a garbage truck outside. There's people in the pool outside. You can probably hear some of it right now. I'm very sorry for that. But anyway, Moonstone, great. Oh my God, fucking so loud. So yeah, Moonstone, great, love it. I think it's a ton of fun to read. I don't think it works well as an adaptation because of the aforementioned reasons. I think it's very enjoyable to read. The mystery is decently compelling, but that's not what makes it an enjoyable read. It's the narrators telling it. So I do still recommend this, love it. I will probably read it again. Frankenstein, fucking love it. Love it, sorry. Why am I, I swear on my channel, why am I apologizing? Whatever, <laughs> Frankenstein. Um, I, uh, okay, I haven't filmed a vlog clip for this particular vlog project, a vlog project in a while. I don't even know what I was doing or what I was saying. Um, Right, so these are all rereads. <laughs> oh my god, this, this vlog project, just brief aside, I'm kind of looking forward to editing it because the clips from, like, that are in this vlog are span so many months. So, like, you'll be able to see my hair grow <laughs> over the course of the vlog. Uh, anyway, Frankenstein. Um, I love it, but up until this um, go-round, I had only ever read the most... Uh, the latest version of it, so the 1831 version. So this time around, I read the 1816, or 1818 version? 1818, yeah. And then I also, I listened to the 1831 one while looking at the 1816 one with the 1818 changes in italics as I went, um, which was like kind of, like I don't recommend doing that if you haven't read Frankenstein before. Um, like I could really only do that because I have read Frankenstein a few times. And so, like, I know what's happening in this... Shush. I'm filming a vlog clip. I know what's happening in Frankenstein. And also because I had just, um, just read the 1818 one. So then, having the 1818 one in front of me while hearing the 1831 one, and, like, because, I mean, you could, uh, physically read them side by side, but, like, I feel like that would be really annoying, and it would be harder to do to look sentence to sentence, because it doesn't really match up that way. But, like, because uh, I listen to it fast, but I can also like scan the page and look for like, is what he's saying right now, is that anywhere on this page? Or is this a completely new addition? Or is there like stuff that was taken out? So like he's saying, I think it's actually three paragraphs down because we cut out the two paragraphs that did come after what you said. Anyway, so like if you're familiar with Frankenstein, I recommend doing that if you're interested in seeing the differences because it's very obvious the differences when you do it that way. It's much harder, I think. Like, I, I generally, like, because I was more familiar with the 1831 one, so reading the 1818 one this time, just by itself, I was like, yeah, this, like, it's Frankenstein, and it feels mostly like Frankenstein. Uh, so it's not like, this is completely different. This is a different book. Like, it's the same book. So, and it had been, you know, at least a year or two since I had read the 1831 one. So I was like, this, this Frankenstein, uh, I don't quite remember it being quite like this. Like, the vibe is a bit different, but... Yeah, it's Frankenstein. Um, so unless you know it like by heart, um, I don't think like it's that apparent which specific things are changed unless there's a, a particular passage or a particular section that you remember really vividly and being like, yeah, this is different. But like overall, you know, like the gist is the same and a lot of the passages are the same or a lot of the passages are very similar and it's only a bit of wording here and there that's changed. So reading that one was a fun experience because I just like generally had like a vibe check. I was like, you know, this is different in tone than I, when I think of Frankenstein, this isn't quite what I think of, even though the story is basically the exact same. And then 
reading it in front of me while I'm listening to the 1831 one, that really is what like makes you see, oh, okay, I see what's changed here. And I see what types of things are getting changed. All that to say, um, I talked about this with my patrons when we did our live chat work as we did read Frankenstein together, um, which hadn't like, when I created this vlog project, it was not known to me that Frankenstein would be a read on my Patreon. Um, so it just kind of happened that way. But anyway, yeah, when I was talking to my patrons about it and then in uh, my wrap up in the month that I've read Frankenstein, um, I talked about how when I was on Goodreads to mark it as reading or as read or, or whatever, I was on Goodreads on the Frankenstein page and was glancing at the reviews. Uh, I wasn't really there to look at reviews, but like one of the top ones was a one star review and I was like, okay, like you don't have to love Frankenstein, but like one star, why? So I, I went and looked at the review and like, it's fair if you don't like Frankenstein, like I don't get it, I think it's great. Um, Kaz, is now the time for this? You wanna get sprayed? No! What was this? Yeah, so if you don't like it, that's fine. But the the author of this review was saying a lot of stuff about how Mary Shelley clearly didn't know men. She was a young, like sheltered girl who like had been talked to only by a po a few poets, and like she thinks this is how men think. But the way that she writes male perspectives, like she clearly has no idea what goes on in the minds of men, and that's just so obvious when you read Frankenstein. And that's like upsetting and hilarious to me because if you read the original Frankenstein, the original original before Percy Shelley touched it at all, um, because even the 1818 one has Percy Shelley's additions to it. Um, what Mary Shelley wrote is a lot less emotional and a lot less melodramatic than what ended up being the like finished product. Like even the 1818 one, the parts that are the most emotion, or maybe not the most emotional, but a lot of the more melodramatic emotional things, or even just like sentences where like the sentence is almost unchanged, except that like he's stuck in an adjective to make it, to emphasize the emotion of it or whatever. It's all like Percy's editions. <laughs> so, I mean, according to this review's author, it's a bunch of poets blowing up, uh, blowing smoke up Mary Shelley's ass that made her think that poet, that, that men think like this. So, I mean, I guess maybe that's that continues to be the case that Percy Shelley is then blowing smoke up the ass of every reader because he is a poet. But it's like his additions to the story that are the most, I don't know, like I, I don't want to put a gender on it, like to say that they are feminine additions. I would not have put it in those terms before. But having read that review, I was like, well, if we're saying that that's like the womanly part of this, the like the feminine part of this it's like clearly no man would think this way or write this way it's like no those are the parts that a man contributed to this book so like fuck off <laughs> um hey stop that so like it's again it's fair if you think that that's too emotive and you don't like it but like also like older books um you know like i'm not saying that i mean patri patriarchy was definitely in full swing in older time periods but like the idea of masculinity and that's like not what this vlog project is about or what I really wanted to talk about with Frankenstein, but ideas of what constitutes masculinity were quite different, you know? Like, um, men wore wigs and high heels and this was, and, and, and lace and, and velvet and, you know, powdered their faces and, um, you know, like the sonnets were written by William Shakespeare. No one was like, oh, what a pussy, you know, what a... Uh, you're like, so gay Shakespeare, everybody. Like, you know, like, it's this, like, macho version of masculinity is, you know, quite a late, uh, I mean, it, it wasn't the standard idea for what is masculine. So, like, I don't know. I feel like this reviewer, not to, like, be calling out this reviewer. So don't, like, go attack them or anything. <laughs> but I'm just, like, I, I think you're telling on yourself. If you think no man would think this way, Maybe, maybe nowadays, I guess, but also like consider how much that is like conditioning of our society. How much like dudes are told not to think emotionally and not to react emotionally. And that's, you know, are there, there, hopefully it's better nowadays with like, I mean, I don't know what the kids are doing these days <laughs> on the playground, but you know, I remember growing up and, you know, it being an insult to say like, you know, you throw like a girl or like, oh, you're going to cry like a girl, like, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, 
the great poets, you know, the people Mary Shelley was hanging out with, like, they were men <laughs> that they were writing this stuff and it's considered great literature. Um, and I mean, just thinking about like the way that Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings and the like bonds of fellowship and friendship and the very like, very like loving language that's used between like Frodo and Sam, um, others as well. But it's, it's not this like, uh, you know, like, you know, love you man, but like no homo, you know, it, it's not that, you know, like that's a very modern idea of what's masculine. Um, so yeah, just the idea that like the way that Victor thinks or the way that the monster thinks um, in Frankenstein or the way that that's depicted by Mary Shelley is like, no dude thinks this way. It's like, well, first of all, how dare you generalize about like half of the population all at once like that? Have you met every man that you can speak with such authority? And, but again, like this idea that like, oh, men don't think poetically, men don't think emotionally, men don't think what, like, I mean, I would say that even nowadays that isn't true. And if it is true nowadays, it's so sociocultural conditioning if that makes that so, if that makes sense. Anyway, that just like really, I don't know if upset, because it didn't upset me. I wasn't mad when I read that review. I was just like, wow, okay, like that, that's a take. Here's why you're wrong. <laughs> and again, it's, you don't have to like Frankenstein. Like you can read it and be like, this is melodramatic and I don't like it. I don't think it's very good. But just like the take that Mary Shelley doesn't know how men think and that this reviewer does know how men think, all men, it was just like, um so anyway um if you are a fan of frankenstein i do recommend picking up like the older editions of it comparing and contrasting it's a fun exercise um if you already like frankenstein if you're like just like kind of casually vaguely or like frankenstein was like one of my less hated assigned readings in school then you probably don't um i love frankenstein so i really enjoyed doing that uh, i had a good time with it and yeah, I mean, I see myself reading Frankenstein again and again for the rest of my life. It's so good. And I feel like it has stood the test of time. And I think it is a shame that it kind of got rewritten so much. I do think the original, I don't know if it's the best. I mean, it is fun to see all the different versions of it. I kind of like that <laughs> with Frankenstein, unlike with most books, you know, with films, we get a lot of like, you know, we get the director's cut, the extended cut, the theatrical cut. That's kind of what this feels like. We have like the director's cut, the extended cut, the theatrical cut. So I like, as a fan of Frankenstein, like, that's fun for me. And I like that we get that. Um, so I guess I'm, I, if it did get all these rewrites, I'm glad that we have been able, that we preserved um, the other versions of it as well. So we can look at them all and you can like, see which one works the best for you and just like be that, that be your Frankenstein, your preferred Frankenstein that you read. Uh, they're all, you know, valid or canon um, as much as the others because they're all written by Mary Shelley more or less. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I love Frankenstein. It remains one of my favorite classics. I will continue to reread it. Um, I haven't really talked at all in this vlog clip about Frankenstein, like the actual like, story that it's about. I talked about it for like two hours with my patrons, um, just about like the symbolism and meaning and who's the real villain and one of my patrons is adamant, um, mild spoilers for Frankenstein, is adamant that because the monster has committed murder and Victor has not, that it is clear that one is the good guy and one is the bad guy. Um, so that, that's valid. If that's your take, that's not exactly my take. Um, I think it's much, it's very, very gray and messy. I don't really have that hard a dividing line between, um, one has killed and one has not, therefore one is good and one is bad. I mean, I get that take. I'm not, it's, it's, it's that's a fair take to have. For me, I think, uh, neither is the hero, neither is the villain. And that's what makes, what makes Frankenstein brilliant is that when you read, and it's also so modern for the time that it's written, that uh, I compared it to Othello, which is one of my all-time favorite Shakespeare plays. It is my favorite tragedy, for sure. Um, and I realized that, you know, I have a type. <laughs> so in Othello, spoilers for Othello, um, in Othello, Othello by the end of it has committed murder. But by the end of the play, I, you know, you don't get the feeling that, that Shakespeare wants you to hate Othello. I, the, the play has not framed Othello as the villain. You are not intended to come away from it hating him and, and villainizing him and yeah. You come away from it not condoning that he has committed murder. Othello himself does not condone that he has committed murder, but you feel for him and you feel that that's why it's a tragedy. Like you feel the tragedy of that situation. He is a tragic figure. And I think that the monster in, in Frankenstein is similar in that sense where like the monster does pretty heinous things even more heinous than Othello 
but you don't come away from Frankenstein going, well, that's clearly just like an evil beastie that must be slain. You know, like he's, it's complicated, it's messy, and you come away from it feeling a lot of sympathy and empathy for the monster, even if you don't condone, nor and I do not condone, the murder that he does. And with Victor, I mean, like, that's, I think, the whole people say, like, Victor's the real monster. Like, I mean, he's not the real monster. It's very um, reductive to say something like that, but I get why people say it, because when you read it, you're, I feel like you get the overwhelming sense that, like, what the monster does is not forgivable, is, is, is pretty bad. <laughs> it's pretty freaking bad. But you feel like it's a little bit like, you know, I compared it to, like, parents and children, you know, like, when a kid acts out, um, up to a, a certain age, people are like, well, this is the parents' fault. Call in the parents. The parents need to teach them better, take care of them better, um, uh, punish them better, give them more boundaries, blah, 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 blah. So, like, Victor is the parent of the, the creature, of the monster, and he has not parented very well. So you're kind of like the buck stops with you, Victor. You created him, and then you abandoned him. So, like, you didn't commit murder, but, like, by extension, a lot of what the monster does is it's your fault that you cre because you created him, but it's also your fault because after you created him, you did not guide him. So, like, you know, like, it's, like, not that you should have expected that, that he would go and commit murder, but, like, what did you expect would happen, buddy? You know, like, you're the educated, knowledgeable, um, responsible party here. You're the one that, like, has the money, has experience of life, has a family, had the know-how to create this life, wanted to do it, no one made you do it, and then you, like, you didn't, you failed to take responsibility for what you had done. Um, and so that, that's why I feel like when you come away from it, you're like, well, Victor's the real monster, even though he's not, um, because you're like, the, the, the monster is the sort of helpless party that is a victim of circumstance and has, has acted out in ways that, that cross a line into unforgivable territory, but you're like, I know how we got there. Which is like what, you know, with Othello is too. Like, you by the end of it, you're like, you know, oh, fair enough. You know, you killed your wife. You know, I get you, man. Like, no. That was, that was very, very, very bad. But you see how that happened. You see how we got there. Um, and he also was a victim of circumstance. Um, so, yeah, I like stories like that. <laughs> I think that's my big problem, though, with people who romanticize that, who, like, it's one thing to say I get the gray area here and I find it fascinating to dwell in the gray versus someone who reads these stories and then like full-on romanticizes it and it's like it's fine <laughs> we we stand that's our especially if it's like a romance because like I like Wuthering Heights a lot I love Wuthering Heights um I like Jane Eyre I like Othello I like um I like the character of the Darkling in the Grisha trilogy, but the people who think that the Darkling is endgame and should be like the romantic interest of the main character, you're like, no, he's a well-written character and he's interesting to read about, but no, <laughs> you know, like I don't, uh, or like Phantom of the Opera, I love Phantom of the Opera, but the Phantom is a murderer. So like at the end, you're kind of like, you kind of wish Christine was with the Phantom because you know, he's a tragic figure. Like you get how we got here. He is a murderer, but like, he's also a victim of circumstance. Like, I love it. I love it to read about it. But I, I don't think that you should walk away condoning that. That's what I have a huge problem with with a lot of people who read these things and feel that way or then go on to write retellings that like paint things in that way where they are now um, having similar things happen except the narrative is framed in a way where you're meant to think it's fine or they write in an excuse for it and you're like, oh no. Half of what makes this interesting is that it is unforgivable. Like, how you know, to wrestle with those feelings of like, I get where you're coming from and yet I cannot excuse what you did. So anyway, Frankenstein's great. I had a good time comparing and contrasting the different versions. Um, yeah, it's really good. You should, you should read it if you haven't, even though I've now kind of spoiled it, but I feel like most people picking up Frankenstein have some idea of what Frankenstein is about and is gonna have in it, so. Sorry if I spoiled it for you. Sorry if I spoiled Othello for you. But uh, yeah. Uh, Onward to the rest of the, the books I have to read for this vlog. <laughs> That's upside down. Jane Eyre. Um, when I started the vlog project, I did not have this amazing edition of it. But one of my patrons gifted this to me. And um, I, I mean, all the children classics are very beautiful. Well, most. There's a couple that are like, I genuinely think are ugly. They're not just like less favorite, but I'm like, 
why. <laughs> but I think of all the children books, this was one of the first ones they did if it wasn't the first. And I think it's the most beautiful. Just the colors, I think it's stunning. I really do. Anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about per se. Um, I'm here to talk about the contents. <laughs> but yeah, Jane, Jane Eyre is, is stunning. It's also very heavy, the children editions. It's a good thing they're tiny. I think they're on thicker paper. I don't really know what makes them so heavy. But anyway, I'm putting this down. Uh, Jane Eyre is so good. It's so good. Okay, so I... <laughs> Um, I read Jane Eyre the first time. This is only my second time reading it. I read it the first time in middle school, I think. Pretty sure I was in middle school. Yes, I'm 100% sure I was in middle school. Oh, doesn't matter why I realized that. <laughs> I was in middle school. I can't remember what grade exactly. Probably seventh grade, I think. So for anyone that's not American, the age that I would be when I read it was 13, maybe 14, um, somewhere around there. So, yeah, um, but I, I liked it because all these years I was like, yeah, I like Jane Eyre. Was my, that was my impression of my reading experience back from when I had that reading experience. But it had been a very long time. And also when I read it, I remembered um, when I first picked it up because like I had never seen an adaptation of it. I'm not sure that I had ever heard of it. Um, I had not, yeah, I didn't know anything about it. But I mostly read classics for fun when I was that age. I hadn't really gotten into fantasy. So if I wanted to read something, I just like went to the classic section and just like picked out something that the cover intrigued me. And then like maybe read the dust jacket and was like, sure, that sounds good. So like a lot of my classics reading was from that age because that's what I was reading for fun. So I picked up Jane Eyre because I liked the cover. Uh, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't this. It was a paperback with like, um, cat. Stop it. You want to get sprayed? I don't have that edition anymore. If I can find a picture of it, then I will put it here somewhere. Um, so that was my impression of the book, the vibe and, and who Jane was. And she's quite pretty on the cover of that book. So one of my first surprises when I started reading it was the description of Jane Eyre as being like uncommonly plain and like borderline ugly and how like, yeah, they, they bring that up a lot. Like. And when I say they, I mean Charlotte Bronte. So like if, uh, I don't know that it's necessary to like drive home the point so much that she's so unfortunate looking. Um, like we get it. Like, I mean, I appreciate that we have a heroine that's not like gorgeous. That's like, uh, you know, an average looking person that you don't have to be stunning like Helen of Troy to be the heroine of a novel. Like I like that about Jane Eyre more so even now than I did then. But it is a little much the way that like, you're still like, the reason it's good to have a heroine that's not a stunning beauty is that like because beauty is not that important but because you keep bringing it up like you're kind of like reinforcing the idea that beauty is really important by like constantly saying she's not beautiful it's like yeah we get it so like move on but anyway um that's not the point of the book <laughs> so yeah when i read it i mean even though i recall enjoying it and i did all these years be like yes i like jane eyre when i read it i was like you know 12 13 years old something like that and i did want to read about beautiful heroines and and beautiful heroes and like it was escapism. Like, that's what I wanted. Um, that's the only thing that I really thought of getting out of reading is is wanting is a story that I would want to live vicariously through. So when I started reading it, and like first, you know, Jane has a terrible childhood, like really terrible childhood. So in my brain, I'm like, yeah, she has to suffer that, like Cinderella, to like get to her happy ending. And then like when we get into it, and it's like, we meet Mr. Rochester, and I, I didn't know anything about Jane Eyre. So it wasn't like, ah, oh, here's the famous Mr. Rochester. I was like, ew, okay. So like, Here's, here's her employer, whatever, he sounds awful. And then like, it, when, I don't know if I was in denial about it or just like wasn't picking up on those signals at that age, but when, it took me a while to realize, I was like, okay, so he is like actually the love interest? And I was like, okay, I, okay. <laughs> Describing him as even uglier than Jane and he's old, which like, I mean, I think he's supposed to be in his thirties. So for back then, for when it was written and for me at the age that I was reading it at both of those you know we were in agreement that 30s is old <laughs> so um yeah I was just like so she's ugly and poor and plain and he's ugly and I mean he's rich so like yay for that but like <laughs> why am I reading this and never and even so I did actually enjoy the book because like the ambiance of being at Thornfield and the mystery of it all and like 
the emotions that Jane is experiencing and being around Mr. Rochester, I was like, okay, I, girl, I do not understand why you feel that way about him. Because he's old and ugly. <laughs> but I was like, I, I feel you, girl. Like, I feel your feelings, even if I don't get why that's the object of her feelings. And then, like, in the latter part of the book, when she's, you know, mild spoilers for Jane Eyre, but, like, when she's away from Thornfield Hall and she's around other characters now, I was like, oh, so maybe Mr. Rochester's not the love interest. I got pretty excited about that. Cause especially because that character that she was around is, is is described as being quite attractive and I was like oh this makes so much more sense he's good and then he definitely is not <laughs> and and reading it now when I was rereading it I was like I can't believe that I was rooting for Sinjin Why would I? <laughs> 13 year old me rooting for Jane and Sinjin like no but um but nevertheless even that even though that was my take on what was going on when I was reading it then um I still liked it and even though it didn't you know, no one turned pretty by the end, spoilers. <laughs> I still enjoyed it because I was like, when I finished it, I was like, you know, I I don't quite get the appeal of this thing that I've read and yet I cannot deny that I have enjoyed my experience with this. And now when I'm, you know, now that I'm old like Mr. Rochester, <laughs> I, I mean, I still, yeah, I still don't love the emphasis on how plain she is and how ugly he is. And he's, you know, quite a problematic, hero hero but much like with Wuthering Heights I don't really read this book as like arguing that these characters are behaving in good ways <laughs> I did also I mean I remember all these years too and watching the adaptations of it which I've you know done a lot more recently than reading the book well now I've read the book most recently but um the Jane refusing you know, spoilers for Jane Eyre I guess um, mild spoilers, so I won't say why this is the situation. But for reasons that are in the book, um, Jane is, you know, choosing to leave the place where Mr. Rochester is. And he's like, no, like, stay with me. And she's like, I can't. I cannot. Uh, it is an issue of, like, morality and integrity. I cannot do that. And, like, <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're great, Jane. I, I respect you, girl. But like, even at 13 years of age, I was like, girl, why not? Like, who cares? <laughs> Just stay with him. It's fine. He, he, I don't get why you were into him, but like, it's fine. Why you, why you gotta be such a goody goody? Um, and reading it now, I still feel a little bit that way. And like, uh, the narrative ultimately rewards her for being that way, which I guess is the point of the story. But like, realistically, life ain't like that. And there is very little... Like, the circumstances that they're in when she makes this choice, there's, like, a pretty, like, you know, borderline zero chance that things would actually work out and that she would end up happy. So it feels very much like you're working against your own happiness and it's only because, like, deus ex machina narrative gods of author wanting happy ending intervene to give you the happy ending. But Jane herself, like... For all intents and purposes, has, has sabotaged her own happiness and her own life. And I get the moral of the story and like why that's necessary or why that, that why that's the choice it's made. But it does feel very much like, you know, you know, Cinderella like just let herself become a slave because like that's how you get a prince. And it's like, no, that's not how you get a prince, because like people just let themselves get walked over and just you know, if people allow themselves to be treated like Cinderella is treated they don't get a happy ending. Like, you you gotta help yourself. You gotta fight for you because ain't no fairy godmother gonna do it for you. So that does annoy me a little bit about Jane Eyre and about Jane Eyre's character where I'm like, she gets a happy ending, but like through no fault of her own, through no like, um, like she, she didn't, I guess she earned it through being good, but she didn't earn it through like working for it, if that makes sense. Um, it's like, despite her best efforts that she gets a happy ending. Weirdly. But I still find it very, very compelling. Like, I think the writing is so good. And the way that the feelings of Jane Eyre at every turn in her life are described and what she's going through and how uh, her thought process behind how she's feeling and, and, and how she justifies it to herself or how she tries to make sense of it. Um, a lot of the conversations between her and Mr. Rochester, like, you know, he's a not, not a great hero. <laughs> like, he's definitely not people who idealize, uh, idealize that romance, romanticize it. Yeesh. Um... But it's still compelling to read about and I think that that's that's the thing that I just 
it's like I love all these books but then I hate most people that love those books <laughs> if that makes sense because I'm like no you're allowed to like this you're not allowed to think it's fine though I don't like that you like this because you think it's fine because I like reading this but I don't it's like if I found somebody that read First Law and they read First Law because they just think all the characters are so heroic and great and everything they do is wonderful I'd be like I love First Law but you're not supposed to think that <laughs> <laughs> no. So I really enjoy reading Jane Eyre and I even enjoy the character of Mr. Rochester. I think he's a fascinating character. I feel I have more appreciation for a character like Mr. Rochester now because um, like when I first read First Law, when I first read The Blade itself, I didn't like it for the same reasons that I was like, ew, Rochester is ugly and mean and old. So like reading First Law, I was like, these characters are like ugly, mean and old and terrible. Why would I want to read about that? Because they're very interesting characters. I do think Mr. Rochester is an interesting character. And I think the dynamic between him and Jane is interesting. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, I still really love Jane Eyre. I think I like it more now than I did then. Um, so rereading it was a good experience. It wasn't like, oof, like it's not as good as I remember. Like, it's very good. It's very good. And I would read it again. Um, I have more love for it now than I even did before. So I am pleased that what I have considered a favorite classic all these years remains a favorite classic. I am extremely pleased to have this edition of it. Um, and yeah, I do really, really like it. And I recommend it, but like, you're not supposed to condone this behavior. You can enjoy reading about it. Those are two different things. <laughs> so that's my take. Um, moving on then to the next book I'm rereading and hoping to still love. Ivanhoe. I was the most nervous to read this one, to reread this one. Um, I also have this beautiful edition that my roommate in college got for me. Um, so I'm just showing this off. It's, that's what's happening right now. But uh, this is the copy I was reading because it's I bought it specifically for this, so I'd have a uh, so I wouldn't feel stressed reading this edition of it. Any who's Ivanhoe, 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 Ivanhoe. My old, uh, quite old now, video that's like my you know top ten favorite books of all time. I uh, Ivanhoe is on on that list. And uh, my patrons read Ivanhoe, Some, not all of them, but a, a good number of my patrons. I should say, uh, actually, very few of my patrons actually read Ivanhoe. A good number of them started it. Most of them DNF'd it. And the couple, like the handful that actually finished it, most of them didn't like it. So um, it had been, hey, do I get sprayed? It had, um, it had been a minute since I read this. I read this um, in high school. Not for school, it wasn't like, uh, like I, I said in one of my previous clips, I think it was about Jane Eyre. Um, when I was in middle school and high school, my for fun reading was classics. Like that's pretty much the only thing that I gravitated towards or considered. So yeah, I read Ivanhoe for funsies in high school and, and loved it. And <laughs> yeah, so since then I've always been like, wow, it's so overlooked, it's so underrated. And then like, it continues to be underrated and overlooked. And then my patrons tried it and mostly hated it. And I was like, maybe there's a reason it's it's not really liked or talked about. Um, like, uh, like I remember really liking it. But, uh, so, um, but at the same time, which is one of the things that I say whenever I bring up Ivanhoe, and I'm like, how are people ignoring Ivanhoe? Is that like this book is the one that kind of like restarted uh, the the like popular romanticization and interest in uh, you know. King Richard, the Lionhearted, Robin Hood, the Crusades, that whole era. Um, and and Robin Hood is the one everyone knows now. Robin Hood is the one that most benefited from this because Robin Hood is in Ivanhoe. And in fact, a lot of what we know about, uh, or the way that we think of Robin Hood nowadays, a lot of that is, it's kind of like mixing together what Ivanhoe is, like who Ivanhoe is in this story, mixing it with Robin Hood. And that's how you get like the modern version of Robin Hood. So people are like, yeah, we like that, but like get rid of Ivanhoe, we're just gonna do Robin Hood. <laughs> we'll just take some stuff that we like from the character of Ivanhoe and just attach it to Robin. So yeah, if you read this, uh, a lot of it will feel familiar. Prince John is in it, King Richard is in it, Alan Adale, um, Friar Tuck, um, Robin Hood, Robin of Loxley himself. Yeah, there's a lot of familiar faces if those are stories you're familiar with. But it's Sir Walter Scott and Ivanhoe that got people interested in that again. And yet Ivanhoe is forgotten and not read and is disparaged. Um, so I'm happy to report that I still love Ivanhoe. Um, this is, it would never have occurred to me, or I guess maybe at the time, I don't know, I, I think I had read some Jane Austen when I read Ivanhoe. I'm not 
completely sure the order of events. I may not have. I've definitely seen Jane Austen like adaptations, but Jane Austen adaptations lose a lot of the like the narration, um, as you would expect. But um, I can tell it's kind of reminds me of Jane Austen, um, and that's a weird thing to say. So let me explain. Um, the way that the thing that is lost in Jane Austen when it's ad uh, when it's adapted is the kind of like acerbic, sarcastic, um, kind of, uh, not condemnation, but like judgment, um, about the, the characters, the principal players of the story, like the narrator of Jane Austen, I guess Jane Austen then, but you know, like the narrator in, in a lot of her books is speaking quite disparagingly of, about the people that the story is about, and also about like, is, is constantly throwing in kind of like sarcastic, um, you know, commentary on society and social norms and on customs, beliefs, practices, etc. Like there's a lot of that in Jane Austen, which you don't really get in the adaptations unless they take that stuff and like give it to a character to say or have a narrator. Ivanhoe is obviously like nothing like Jane Austen in terms of the type of story that it is. This is a Robin Hood type story, except that it's about Ivanhoe. <laughs> Robin Hood's just also there. Um, so, you know, there's, you know, it's medieval times, there is jousting, there is uh, people coming back from the Crusades, it's Saxons v. Normans, um, it's written with a lot of these and that, these and thous and thou shalts and thou wilts and hast thou, blah blah blah, like that kind of talk. Um, but it's also written, so this is historical fiction for the time in which it was written. So unlike Jane Austen, who was writing about her contemporaries, Sir Walter Scott is writing about ye olde times in that so like it's uh, a snapshot of like how this period of history the one in Sir, Sir Walter Scott is living in now viewing a previous time so it's like nested history anyway so uh as the the narrator of the story is telling it from the point of view of somebody from the present day meaning Sir Walter Scott's present day where he's like, he'll say things like, nowadays we would understand this to be blah blah blah, or history told us that blah 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 happened, but this is, so like, it's like talking to the reader as a contemporary of Sir Walter Scott to place that reader in, to contextualize for the reader the time in which the story is taking place. Anyway, all that to say, the reason it reminds me of Jane Austen is because this, I, I keep, that's what I, one of the things I keep saying about Ivanhoe when I'm like, why is it overlooked? It's like, it has everything. It has like adventure and romance, and um, action, and uh, suspense, and humor. It has so much humor. Um, there are like a couple of characters that are like fools, that are like jester type characters, so they say amusing things. But the, the narrator is constantly saying things that are like pretty obviously like judging the, the conventions of the time, the thinking of the time, and, and making um, I don't know how, I feel like I thought of a word while I was reading it and I was like, that's what I'm going to say in the clip, but now I've forgotten what word I was going to use. Um, but it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of mocking, um, the characters for holding the views that, that they do and for, uh, their hypocrisy, because there's a lot of hypocrisy. You know, all these people walking around with like, my honor will not allow and I have sworn and, you know, as a Christian knight, I have to blah, blah, blah. Um, and the narrator is pretty, like, pointing out all the times that they're being, like, massive hypocrites. And is, like, yeah, it's it's funny and it's kind of mean. <laughs> it's, it's, it's commentary while I'm telling the story. Um, yeah. And and the, the romance of it is also kind of, uh, kind of funny and kind of modern. Um, the, the principal romance, I guess you'd say, is between Sir Wilfred of Ivanhoe and, um, his father's ward, uh, Rowena. And, like, the, yes, <laughs> that's the principal romance, but, um, Ivanhoe's kind of into this other woman who is Rebecca, the son of Isaac, the Jew. Um, and there's a lot in the story to kind of, like, both by showing and by telling, um, to kind of like, I don't know how best to say this, but like there was a lot of anti-Semitism obviously. I mean, there is nowadays and there certainly was 
in the period in which the story is taking place, i.e. the Crusades period. So all these Knights Templar, you know, if you have a, a Jewish character or Jewish characters who are, of course, moneylenders, um, the, you know, there's like constantly anti-Semitism. But the story that Sir Walter Scott wrote is like casting anyone who's like anti-Semitic as the villain and has Wilfred be kind of more into Rebecca than he is into Rowena. And in general, Rebecca is, is painted as a much more noble, virtuous, and interesting character. And there's just like a lot more going on with her character. Rowena is just kind of like also there. <laughs> um, so yeah, like it goes there too. Like, um, I'm not going to say that it, that this book like stands the test of time and handles issues of anti-Semitism perfectly. I'm certain that it doesn't. I would not be the person to comment on that. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's stuff about it that has not aged well and is not ideal. But overall, it's I mean, kind of like with Shakespeare and the Merchant of Venice. Like, he's he's writing in a time period um, where people are not thinking very progressively about these things. And again, painting a character like Shylock as he, I guess he's the villain of the piece, but like not really. Like the audience doesn't come away from Merchant of Venice being like, like hating Shylock. You know what I mean? Um, and and he gave Shylock the very famous, you know, um, uh, if you cut us, do we not bleed? Speech. Um, and uh, Sir Walter Scott does open a lot of chapters with Shakespeare passages. That's because like, every chapter opens with a quote from some bit of literature. Can we not, my child? Is now the time for this? So he does quote Shakespeare a bit. And of course, I'm 99% sure there was a Merchant of Venice quote, at least one. Yeah, I love it. And I feel like if it was just like, I don't know, regarded at a level with like every other classic, you know, that's like, it's not exactly like, uh, you know, flying off bookshelves, people aren't clamoring for it, but, you know, like with Dickens and, um, Bronte and Austin, that it, it was just, like, among those, and everyone was like, yes, and Ivanhoe. But no, like, most people haven't read it, so a lot of people haven't even heard of it. <laughs> um, and that's what I don't get. Like, I don't, if it's not your favorite classic, fine. And if, like, classic, because it, it's, it's more verbose, it's more, like, uh, wordy and old-fashioned and and formal and stilted and like sure like that's not how modern novels are written like I, if that's not your jam I get it but I don't get why people who read classics who like reading classics are not reading slash liking Ivanhoe and I don't get why no one is adapting Ivanhoe which is what I like ranted about for a long time when I in my like 10 best of whatever my favorite books video because like it would be such a good movie there's a lot of the book is like action stuff. I mean like the the tournament scene where where you have the arrow being split by the another arrow is from Ivanhoe. Yeah, there's a there's jousting, there's an archery contest, there's battle, there's like, you know, running through the forests and, and altercations in the woods, you know, as per Robin Hood's story. There's like secret identities and rivalries and betrayals and a romance and lots of humor, which you could I mean, you could do it verbatim, but you could also adapt it and then modernize that side of things. Yeah, I mean, there is a movie of Ivanhoe from like way back in the day. And I think Elizabeth Taylor plays Rebecca, I think. And, and I think Joan Fontaine plays Rowena. Like, that's how old it is. Um, and I think there was a made-for-TV one in like the 80s or something. That's, you know, low budget. A TV adaptation and like this is something that demands like a high budget this demands like a Ridley Scott type movie where we can have like the huge high budget scenes with all the horses and armor and the jousting and the all of that <laughs> so Ivanhoe's great we should read Ivanhoe I mean if it's yeah it's 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 old-fashioned like the and a lot of the humor I mean I really like Shakespeare so a lot of the humor it's kind of like when you read Shakespeare and uh, or see a Shakespeare play and the humor is like nested wordplay that like you have to be paying attention to what they're saying and you realize like if you're paying attention to what they're saying you'll be like oh I see what you did there <laughs> you're that now that you were being snarky there I don't know if I can like randomly flip to an example of that Okay, so I've been sitting here trying to find a passage to read to you and I've been chuckling to myself because a lot of it's funny, but I would have to read like two whole pages to you to get the punchline. Cause it's like, that's what I mean, that you have to pay attention and it's not like quick quick zippy obvious jokes. Like the, the build up for it is 
quite long and it's just kind of ongoing it's just like ongoing context for what they're saying and so they like there might be more payoff for a joke much later based on something that they were talking about before like the very beginning of the book opens with like the two jester type characters and their their banter is not like quippy and zingy like they, they seem to be talking just kind of about the general situation and the the rivalry between Normans and Saxons in ye olde England and that is important context for the story that like that's how England used to be um that this, this was a big point of contention and it is it it's very important to the story to know that uh to have that context but like there's a lot of like witticisms and a lot of um sardonic observations about the way of the world <laughs> as pertains to that which um is in that conversation but I'd have to be like reading you the entire conversation. There's no like one liner that could go on a bookmark or on a month. Maybe that's why Ivanhoe's overlooked because you can't really quote it in like one line. There's no like quotable quotes. I mean, I guess there are, but they almost all of them require context because if you have the context while you're reading it, you're like, why how like how clever and how witty or how wise or how interesting. But yeah, anyway, I still love Ivanhoe. I still think it's great. And I think if you're, if you are interested in picking it up, because I'm praising it, be warned, my patrons picked it up and hated it for the most part. And I think if you're the kind of person that enjoys Shakespeare and enjoys verbose classics and enjoys involved, <laughs> lengthy, I don't know, um, just I you know they have more verbose old fashioned style of writing then you could you could definitely enjoy it. I, I think more people should read it. Anyway, that's that does it. Mostly this was a success. I don't think yeah, I think every classic that I reread I loved still. I had different opinions about some of it, particularly I think Count of Monte Cristo and Phantom of the Opera were the two that I came away feeling the most differently about. But yep, they're all still favorites. So whew, crisis averted. Let me know in the comments down below if you enjoyed this video, if you did not enjoy this video, if you've read these classics, if you have not read these classics, if I've inspired you to read them, if I've convinced you never to read them, <laughs> whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times will be on Saturdays, so like and subscribe, join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you.